This time, we're looking at the period in between the end of Marvel Star Wars and the birth of the EU as we know it with Timothy Zahn's novels and the comic series from Dark Horse. We're talking about the Dark Times. This episode is going to be structured a little differently, as the stories that we're talking about here are also stories that don't involve any of the main Star Wars cast in any significant role. There will definitely be some world building, and there'll be both far too much and too little material to truly review in one episode. Confused? That's okay. Keep watching. All shall be on become clear. So, after the end of Marvel Star Wars, when the Ewoks and Droids animated series and made-for-TV movies had finished, Star Wars was, in terms of new media of the franchise, done. George Lucas and Lucasfilm went on to work on the remaining Indiana Jones films and the young Indiana Jones television series. And also Howard the Duck and the Radioline murders, but everyone would probably prefer we forgot about those. As far as anyone with any decision-making power related to the property was concerned, Star Wars was over. Dead. Done. Finn. No one was interested in it, so no one would buy any more of it. No one would pay money for more of it, so why bother? Let's put this in perspective. After the original series of Star Trek was cancelled, Gene Roddenberry would not let the work go. He knew there was a fan base for his creation, indeed he'd helped promote it by embracing the fan scene, from conventions to fanzines to the letter writing campaign. So, after Star Trek was cancelled, in addition to working on his other projects like the Questor tapes, Gene repackaged Star Trek in the form of an animated series that could, theoretically, be produced on a smaller budget than a live action television series. Then, when that ended, he worked on repackaging Star Trek again as another television series as Star Trek Phase Two, which eventually led into the motion picture. And, as a kicker, Star Trek continued in the form of novels, including books by people who had written for the show, like David Gerald, or who had written adaptations of the show, like James Blish. On top of that, the show received an ongoing comic book by Gold Key. Star Trek was not going quietly into that good night. And just before anyone suggested that Lucas or other anyone at Lucasfilm didn't know this, Star Trek went through all of this before A New Hope came out. You know who else didn't go quietly into that good night? Doctor Who. Not long after the show was placed on indefinite hiatus, and the fans realized that indefinite hiatus was another way of saying cancelled, without actually saying was the show was cancelled, people looked at the money being left at the table and started looking for ways to pick that up. Doctor Who magazine already had an ongoing comic, and they kept that going, picking up after the conclusion of the seventh Doctor's last story. Meanwhile, Virgin Publishing scooped up the rights to publish novels based on Doctor Who, and proceeded to publish the New Adventures line, featuring new stories with the seventh Doctor and Ace, along with the Lost Adventures line, with other stories from pre with previous Doctors and their companions. Both the books and the comics were able to tell stories without the show's budgetary limitations, in the case of Virgin Books, they also stepped outside the content limitations of the TV show, telling stories with more violence and sexuality than could be told on TV. After the failed TV movie with Paul McGann, the rights of the novels moved in-house with the BBC, but the books kept coming. Further, Big Finish got the rights to put out audio dramas featuring various incarnations of the Doctor, 
starting with um, 5 through 7, and then later moving on to add Paul McGann's 8th Doctor, and now in the present day, including David Tennant's 10th Doctor and John Hurt's War Doctor. In other words, once Doctor Who and Star Trek started, there have always been works telling stories with the characters from those shows in whatever iterations of those shows that came about. On the other hand, after those other works ended, as far as 20th Century Fox and Lucasfilm were concerned, there was no longer any interest in stories from a long time ago and a galaxy far, far away. And then, Scrappy Band of Misfits put together a plan and were able to get the license from the Empire, not to tell a new wave of stories, but to enable a group of other people to tell those stories, that group being you. Yes, you. And by you, I mean a general and, and, and a specific you, and by telling those stories, I mean in the context of a tabletop role-playing game. One where you and a bunch of friends sit around a table and collaboratively tell a story together while rolling dice to represent how random chance and the actions of other forces have an effect on events. The game used West End Games' D6 system, which used what's called a dice pool system. This means that checks in the games are ro done by rolling a bunch of dice, in this case, six-sided dice the amount determined by your stats and your skill levels. In this case, this is a roll and add system, meaning the dice are added together, along with any modifiers, and the result is also compared to a target number to determine if you succeed or fail. From a practicality and accessibility standpoint, this is absolutely perfect, as in order to play the game, all you really need is a copy of the rules and a Yahtzee set to cannibalize. West End Games put out a ton of RPG books over their run, expanding on the universe through the introduction of not new non-player characters for your players to interact with, new worlds for you to visit, and new gadgets and vehicles to drive and use, along with a variety of pre-written adventures for the game as well. The material during this time was set in what we've now come to describe as either the Dark Times or the Rebellion period, after the rise of the Empire, but prior to and somewhat contemporaneous with the films. Campaigns were meant to be structured around players working with the Rebel Alliance, either as Rebel operatives or as fringe scoundrels who've gotten roped into the Alliance. Characters were meant to be fairly low power to begin with, with the characters potentially becoming as skilled as characters in the films over the course of a campaign. Stormtroopers were actually a deadly threat to beginning characters, and some of the higher tier enemies were things that you would be running away from pretty fast. The game also introduced a few new concepts that were picked up by later writers, and some of which have carried on to the current form of the EU. Imperial Inquisitors were originally invented as threats for Force-sensitive and hedged Jedi characters to face that aren't Darth Vader, with the idea being that if Vader shows up, the thing to do is ro to run the hell away. Imperial Intelligence was also introduced as a more mundane threat for characters to face. Stormtroopers were obstacles in your day-to-day -day life. Imperial Intelligence would be the thing that's hunting you actively. When Timothy Zahn was approached to write what, be, what would become the Thrawn trilogy, and Dark Horse got the comics license for Star Wars, the creators in all of those works ended up receiving a very big box full of books from the Star Wars RPG to use as reference. Now, the main thing keeping me from wholeheartedly recommending the West End Games RPG is that it's out of print and getting it progressively more expensive to acquire legally by the day. As well, no new books are getting published, and thus there's a finite supply of material out there. Now, if Disney, West End Games, and say Fantasy Flight Games, the current holders of the Star Wars RPG license, were to put together a deal that would allow for the books to be legally distributed as PDFs through a site like Drive-Thru RPG, I'd be 100% down with that. As it is, if you can find them at a reasonable price on eBay or on a used RPG bookstore near you or on a site like Half Price Books, then I definitely recommend picking them up that way. But otherwise, frankly, the main core books are probably going to be the most accessible, and you can certainly run a game just with those. The experience has certainly enriched some if you've got some of the source books to go with it. Those will vary in price depending on book by book basis. Some books are more rare than others. So, 
if you're into RPGs, check it out. It's probably one of the easier ones to get into from a, just a raw mechanical stuff standpoint. Because it all runs on a D6 system. As opposed to the Wizards of the Coast one, which used the D20 system, so you need a full set of gaming dice there. And the current Fantasy Flight game system, which requires some very special dice that are distinct to that system that you would have to buy specially online from somewhere else. Now, next time, we enter the EU as we know it with the Zahn Trilogy. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something in particular you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.